we have the story of how the New York Times develops and grows its customer base. And to share that story with us, please welcome the Executive Director for Retention and Customer Experience at the New York Times, Ben Cotton. Thank you all. Here we go. Um, so a few words about myself first. Um, the exec executive director of retention and customer experience at the Times. I've been at the Times uh, for about three and a half years now. I worked for a couple of years on our corporate strategy team uh, and have been working within our consumer revenue group in a couple of different roles over the last um, year and a half, most recently, and, and now obviously in charge of subscriber retention. Um, and so I'm really excited to, to be here to talk to you talk to you all for a few minutes about sort of what we learned over the last several years of developing a, a paywall and what we're focusing on now. Um, show of hands first, how many of you are subscribers to the New York Times? OK, not bad. I'll try to sign a few of the rest of you up by the end of this presentation. Um, so I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about sort of three things. One, a little bit of history, um, where we started uh, and sort of how we've come along over the last several years to where we've gotten to today. Um, a lot of times when I talk to, 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 to folks at other media companies about this, uh, it, it's sort of a, a question about what we're, what we're doing right now, even though um, you know, other companies may be, may be earlier in their, uh, the, the journey of their subscription product. And I think it's really important uh, to, to recognize that it takes time, um, and you have to experiment and learn as you go. Um, and, and in some ways, you, you can accelerate as much as you can, but uh, there are always going to be sort of mistakes and things to learn around the way, along the way. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the pivot that the company has made just in the, over the last couple of years to really emphasize our digital subscription product and make that the focus um, of our entire company's efforts. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of this year and beyond and what we've done um, and are doing to set ourselves up for success going forward. So first, where we started. Um, so we launched the pay model in 2011, as uh, I think a number of you probably know. Um, this was in part a reaction to the, to the financial crisis and the, the trends in the industry. Um, print advertising coming under increasing pressure. Uh, we needed new streams of revenue, and digital subscriptions were, were sort of a, a clear place to look. Um, I'll say that the, at the time that this happened, I mean, this was before my time at the company, but I remember it well, as I'm sure many you do too, um, there was a lot of skepticism over this. A lot of people who thought that there were too many free options online, that nobody was going to pay for the New York Times online. Um, and so what we went out with was a very liberal uh, model, um, a freemium model that allowed you to get 20 articles um, in a month, quite a large number. Uh, any print subscriber got full free access to our digital product, and we had what we refer to as a leaky wall. So there were a lot of ways, uh, even if you'd hit your paywall, to, to the paywall to come in and, and get access to more articles, whether it was via social media channels or email. Um, there, were, there were sort of a lot of ways to, to get in. We didn't want to, to do too much to keep people who wanted to read the Times um, from reading. We lowered the, at, at, we saw success um, early on and, and lowered the, uh, lowered the paywall to 10 articles. Um, but a lot of what happened then was sort of very of the time. Um, we had marketing that was very focused on um, content. We had pricing tiers that were differentiated by devices. So you paid one price to get access on the smartphone, and another price to get access on the tablet, and a third price to get access on the computer and every device. Um, you know, at the time, this made a lot of sense and, and drove a lot of money for us. Uh, uh, but over time, this is something, as you'll see, that we've, we've moved away from. Um, so the initial growth, actually, it became clear pretty quickly that it was going to be better than we uh, had thought. You know, a lot of people getting over a million digital subscribers, a lot of people didn't think that was something that was going to be able to happen. Um, and so we really uh, we, we started realizing that there was really something here and that this was something that could be a big part of the company's future. Um, so a couple of years ago, we shifted to what we call the subscriber first model. And so, uh, you know, in addition to, to, to sort of headwinds at print advertising, um, there are a number of, of, of difficulties when it comes to growing a digital advertising business, although we remain big believers in that. And we realized that if we were gonna, to see, going to see growth um, and be successful as a digital company, 
we really needed to double down on subscriptions and that, that that had to involve not just myself and colleagues in the marketing department, but people in product and technology and even the newsroom. Um, we really had to say that, that customers and subscribers were going to be at the center of our subscription business. Um, so that, that, that there were a number of changes that that sort of heralded about the way that we were thinking about things. Um, shifting from sort of equal emphasis on subscription and advertising to, to saying that we were going to be sub subscriber first and that we weren't, um, you know, most of the, the, the attention um, from the, the company's leaders was going to go towards that. Shifting from those devices that I, I showed on an earlier page to making our price points more about value and making clear to subscribers and prospective subscribers that we were investing in them um, and investing in making a better and better product for them. Shifting from having sort of a, a free product that we really emphasized with a, uh, with a, with a, a a paywall that people ran into and that we sort of hoped people went past, to saying we were going to think about our paid product first. We were going to think first about what you got as a subscriber, and then we were going to look for ways to pull people over from a, a more limited free product. Shifting from short-term offers to what we call LTV-focused offers, um, so worrying a little bit less about uh, how many, the raw number of people we can get in the door um, in, a given, in a given day or week or quarter, and making sure that the, the, the folks we bring in um, are on uh, pricing and, and, and discount offers that are focused on customer lifetime values. So this gets towards where I come in um, with making sure that we're bringing in people we can actually retain as subscribers. And then again, on the, the, the retention side, rather than being sort of defensive about it and trying to make sure that when a subscriber wants to cancel, uh, ra rather, rather than, than saying when a subscriber wants to cancel, okay, that's then the time that we'll try to figure out how to keep them. Um, putting more of a focus on customer experience and trying to make sure that we're proactive about making subscribers happy and getting them interested um, in what we want to do. And so the result, uh, growth has accelerated. If you look at the last two years, um, 2016 was the biggest year for subscription growth in the company's history. 2017 passed that. Um, and so we're now, when you look at our, our digital news product and our, our sort of our, our separate standalone digital subscription products, um, Cooking and Crosswords, which we'll talk about a little bit as well, we're at, at 2.6 million um, digital-only subscriptions. Now, there's, there's sort of an, you know, an elephant in the room around this, um, and there's been a lot of sort of an, an interest in the way that this has transpired. One of the charts that I like to, to show um, th from, from, from late 2016 and early last year was that we had a tremendous amount of volatility for a period um, in when our subscribers were coming in. So you can see, obviously, this, is the, this was the most recent election. Um, this was the inauguration. This was around a time when we ran a, we ran a, a television campaign um, during the, the Oscars, the Academy Awards in the US. Um, and these things all led to, to big spikes in subscriptions. There's some other ones in here when um, now President Trump tweeted at us one time or another that for, for a while, like every time that happened, you know, we, saw a, we saw a spike in subscriptions. Um, you know that's that's come, that's come down a little bit. That um, that the, the 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 frothiness just sort of purely around the election. Obviously, we're more than a year past it now. Um, but where it's left us is that we have more subscribers than ever before. We have, um, as I said, more than two million digitally, and still about a million subscribers in print. Now, um, you know, a question I get a lot is sort of how much the, the growth over the last couple of years. How much is that? Um, how much is, was that sort of based just on the news cycle, and how much is that based on the, the tools that we at the times have developed um, to, to, to drive subscriptions uh, in a more aggressive way? And the answer is that it's a combination of both. Um, you know, being in the news business, the news cycle is always going to be a big part of what's driving, um, uh, driving the business cycle. Um, at the same time, a lot of what we did and have done over the last couple of years, which I'll talk a little bit more about, is sort of what set us up to be able to take advantage of that. So having a better pricing structure and having better uh, uh, brand marketing um, and having a better strategy for acquiring subscribers on, on social media, those are things that we had sort of invested in over the last couple of years in the period leading up to the, um, the, the election period. And that's what meant that when that, the news cycle got as hot as it did, we were really able to harvest all of the demand that was that that sort of came onto our website and into our apps from prospective subscribers and make sure that they were able to subscribe. And so the reality is, is that while well, you know, this, this volatility has, not, has, 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 has calmed down a little bit, um, 
we're still acquiring and retaining new subscribers at much, much higher rates than we were uh, before all of this election period happened. Um, so going ahead a little bit and talking about sort of what, we're, what we've been doing over the last year especially and how that sort of points to what we're going to be doing this year in 2018 um, and beyond. There's three main things I want to talk about. One, um, emphasizing competitive advantage through value-driven messaging, and I think this is something that, that any publisher uh, should, who's running a subscription business should try to learn from and, and do. Um, building deeper relationships with subscribers, so getting into what I, in particular, am focused on, and then investing in, in new long-term growth areas to make sure that we have uh, new avenues to drive subscriptions if the ones that we're focusing on right now start to slow down. Um, so the first one, uh, you know, when it comes to sort of building on your competitive, competitive advantage in how you market to subscribers, um, you know, we have been doing brand messaging in a very new way over the last, you know, 18 months. Um, we are really trying to make sure that we're customer first about it. We're, we're not sort of pummeling people with, um, with, with, with special discount offers or, or sales and are instead focusing on... Um, uh, showing people the, the message that's going to be the most effective um, at a given time. And so in some cases, this is where I like to start, uh, that actually doesn't even involve um, the price. Um, we, when, the, when the, there's sort of a, a peak news period, be that an election period or there's sort of a, you know, God forbid, a, a hurricane or some kind of a natural disaster, I mean, we see it as a public service to be able to, we see what we're doing as a public service to be giving people information um, about what's going on in incredibly important events in the world. And so rather than trying to take a period like that and cut people off and, and force some of them to subscribe, you know, we see at, that as a, as, a, as a time when probably a lot of people are going to be coming um, to the New York Times website or apps for the first time. We want to make sure that they have a good experience, that they experience the best of what the Times has to offer. And we figure that long term, from a brand perspective, that's going to make it easier for us to um, convince some of those people to subscribe, even if that's weeks or months or years down the road. The messaging we do really leans into the value of the Times. Um, when it comes to you know, the number of journalists we have in the field, the number of journalists we have um, overseas in sort of every corner of the globe, um, how much time and effort goes into the deep investigative pieces that they do. These are things that are really compelling um, to subscribers, uh, both people who are thinking about subscribing and people who we hope to keep as subscribers. And so we lean into that. Um, we've been leaning into that as much as we, as much as we can. And then even tying the cost of that, the, the sort of having those journalists out in the field and having them spend time um, uh, on, on deep investigated pieces, you know, that costs money and we try to really connect the value of a subscription to doing that. You know, if you're spending money on a subscription, this is where that money is, is going. Uh, we found that that's, that's something that's very compelling for people. It extends to social too. I mean, we've tried to do a much better job in connecting our... Our, our subscription messaging on Twitter, on Facebook, and other social channels um, to be less sort of generic and less about a particular um, uh, price or offer on a given day and more about you know, a particular, um, particular story that's out or a particular brand message that we feel like is really going to resonate at a given time. And then lastly, on this front, adapting our offer strategy. So we, you know, I talked about how we used to, to base our pricing tiers on devices. Um, we don't do that anymore. And we have really been investing in products and, and features that can drive more and more value for subscribers, prospective subscribers, um, when they're considering subscribing. So if you want to subscribe just for, for the news, you know, that's, that's here. But we have a, a cooking product now, a Crosswords product that are both standalone subscription products that we get a, a lot of people to pay a little bit more to get access to as part of a bundle. We still got home delivery, obviously. Um, and, and we found that this helps us drive not just more subscribers, but subscribers at a higher ARPU. Um, you know, bringing in as many subscribers as we can is great, um, uh, but getting them to some of them to pay more when they do uh, is even better. So switching over to, to my side of the house, um, the, the, the retention and customer experience part, um, one of the things that's so exciting about bringing subscribers in in kind of a new way, in a way that's more value-driven, is that it, it actually makes it easier for us to retain them. And we've been, we've been seeing subscribers year over year retaining better and better. And part of that is because we then are able to take that kind of 
messaging and, and tailor that to subscribers themselves. So from the first onboarding email that my team sends out to subscribers, we're trying to reinforce uh, the value that we just used to get you to subscribe. We are always looking for new ways to engage our subscription base. So here's we've got some snapshots from events we've done from subscribers over the past year, uh, whether it was with the Prime Minister Trudeau in, in Canada or whether it was having subscribers um, into the building for tours or whether it's engaging subscribers online through subscriber-only um, uh, video chats or live chats or conference calls. We are always experimenting with new ways to give subscribers value. Um, we, there was an announcement. Um, at the South by Southwest conference last week that we're coming out with a new um, podcast called, called Caliphate that's uh, about, about ISIS. Um, and it's, it's actually, it's gonna be, we think, one of the best podcasts we've ever done, and that's actually gonna be available early to subscribers. Um, uh, so that's gonna be an, a, sort of another experiment we're doing, and we're doing a lot of things like that um, over, the course of, over the course of this year. There's another component to this, which is that you can even go further um, once you, We've sort of we've we've captured subscribers and we've retained them and we've sort of assured we've we've we're convinced that we're sticking around. Uh, we can actually use them to drive uh, extra subscribers. They can become sort of ambassadors for our brand of a of a sort. And whether that's um, giving them opportunities to gift subscriptions to friends or refer friends or family members, um, we can use that to expand uh, the reach of our subscription messaging even further. running short on time and I want to leave a couple minutes for questions. So just going to talk for a minute about new growth strategies we're pursuing in addition um, to the core news one. Um, you know, we believe there's a lot more growth to be had in our core news product, but we also want to make sure that we're investing and experimenting in as many different ways as we can uh, with, with attracting, with ways to attract new different audiences. Um, so one of those is through our Crosswords product. This is something that was, was new um, a, a, a few years ago. As many of you probably know, we've had crossword puzzles in um, the print newspaper for just over 75 years now. Just had a, an anniversary there that we, we, we celebrated a little bit. Um, uh, and so, you know, a few years ago, colleagues had the, uh, had the insight that, that a lot of people um, really loved the crossword, even independent of anything else, and probably if, even if they weren't willing to pay for the whole newspaper or the whole news product, they probably were willing to pay for crosswords. So we created an app um, in-house for the first time, and on, over the last few years, this has grown to you know, more than 300,000 subscribers, which is a really huge and meaningful number. It's become a big part of our business. Uh, related, um, we had sort of an insight at one point that we had you know, more than 18,000 recipes uh, that the Times had published going back more than 50 years. Um, but those were buried. Uh, they were in print archives or in digital archives and they weren't accessible. Um, and so the insight that we had was, well, maybe if we pulled those out, put them into a product, uh, a, 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 a sort of a new kind of a recipe database um, uh, that was an exciting digital product uh, that would really be something that you couldn't get anywhere else in terms of the quality of recipe and the quality of the user experience around a digital cooking product. Um, but that maybe would be something that people would pay for too. So this was something that was a few years in development. Paywall went live last year, and this has also seen a lot of early success. And as you saw on a previous slide, creating these separate digital subscription products, it not only allows us to bring in new customers, it also allows us to get more money from the customers we already have, whether that's through bundling or upsells or cross-sells uh, to other products like this. And then to note about international, um, we have been growing faster internationally than we have in the U.S. and it's the, the portion of our subscriber base that that represents has been ticking up. Um, this is a, a, another place where we, see, we imagine that in the future uh, this is going to become a big part of, uh, an, an even bigger part sort of of our growth story. Um, in closing, I guess I just want to say two things. I mean, one, I want to emphasize again that if, if this is a strategy that you're going to pursue, it's absolutely critical that the whole company is behind it. I mean, we have our partners, editors and reporters in the newsroom who are heavily involved um, in our subscription business in a number of ways right now. They're coming to events uh, where they're sort of the star attraction to interface with subscribers. They're sometimes a part of our marketing um, when, when, when we're highlighting their work or we're even using them directly to reach out to current subscribers we have to thank them for supporting us. Um, and the second thing is to focus on where you have competitive advantages. You know, those examples I threw up at the end around crosswords and cooking were, were good examples where we identified that we had a pocket of value uh, that was unique to the New York Times and that we could use um, to drive more willingness to pay among our customers. Um, I would encourage all of you to look for similar opportunities.
Thanks very much. Thanks, Ben. We'll just fit in one quick question, if you're, if you're willing. Sure. So uh, raise your hand if you have a question. So we've got two here, um, and we'll take... Uh, yes, we'll do the back one first. We'll come to you in a moment. Hi, I'm Marcus from PV Digest. I put my hand up as a New Times subscriber. Excellent. But I'm a subscriber to incredibly low price. I'm paying $4 a month for a complete uh -huh. year. So I wonder if you dare to forecast the probability of me becoming a full-paying subscriber next year. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, do, I, I, know, I know what the odds are based on my... Go pull up one of my models. Um, but, I mean, I think... So we do... Uh, where are you from? Are you from Germany? Or So, so internationally, we do quite... Well, everywhere we do quite a lot of price experimentation. We do that in particular internationally. Um, because we are always thinking about you know, the, p the way that people engage with the Times internationally and the way that they are considering paying for the Times internationally may be different. Um, in some cases, it may be that they're someone who's an, you know, an expat from the US uh, who is willing to subscribe to the Times as their main source of news. But in other cases, uh, they are, uh, they're, they're people who are probably already subscribing to a local news source and are thinking about subscribing to the Times in addition. And those people may think about the um, the price of the times and the relative value they're getting for it differently. And so we experiment quite a lot with what the different prices are uh, uh, that, that we, we offer people. Um, we also experiment, to your point about sort of the price going up to, to full price, we experiment quite a lot with the way we do that. Um, whether we give people, you know, when, when people get to the moment um, that we're, you know, after 12 months or three months or however the long the, the discount period is that they're stepping up. Um, we experiment with a number of ways, some of which are just based on the messaging that we're showing to them, and some of which are based on um, stepping up their pricing sort of to a, a midpoint before going all the way up um, to try to ensure that most people like yourself stick around and that most people like yourself stick around at a higher price over time. So that sounded to me like an absolute guarantee that you'll never pay any more and you're quite <laughs> safe, which I think is what you were hoping for. <laughs> so that's good. One more quick one here, if it could be quite short, please. Hi, um, I come from Colombia, from uh, Publicación de Semana. It's one of the largest independent media group and one of the last. And we have the most influential political magazine in our country. We're launching our paywall in the next month or so before presidential elections, which happen in June. That's great. Do you have any advice <laughs> at this moment? I think <laughs> tragically, I, this needs to be a fairly short answer. No, no, no. Listen, I mean, I think I mean that that's fantastic. That's great. I mean, I'm 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 happy for you, and that's really exciting to hear. One of the things that is encouraging, we think it's just very exciting that more and more places are doing um, paywalls because we just think it's it's a great thing for for the future of journalism in general. Um, I mean, I, I would say be ready to experiment really quickly. I mean, I'm sure you've got you know you've got a, a pricing structure and you've got a you know, business rules around how much people are going to get, uh, if anything, before they have to pay. I would just be ready to be, be, uh, to, to be changing things very quickly. You know, if the price isn't working, change it. If the uh, access is too liberal or not liberal enough, change it. Um, particularly when you're doing it sort of around a news event, you want to make absolutely sure that you get the most you can out of that. I don't think we were ever experimenting more quickly than we were sort of in the period leading up to our last election, because um, even day to day, we could see significant changes in performance based on what we were trying. I would try different types of, of, of marketing message, messages, and I would try them differently on, on different channels. I'm sure that could have been a longer answer. Sadly, <laughs> we have no time for any more questions. Can I ask you, please, to thank Ben? Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.